Thank you everybody uh, for attending this session and welcome to the session Hybrid Methods 1. Uh, this session consists of three regular talks and two short talks. And so after each uh, short, so if each regular talk, which is a video of about 12 minutes, we have three minutes for questions. So I, uh, I welcome you to already uh, type into the chat if any questions arise and uh, so that we can use the three minutes after the talk efficiently for maybe getting some answers to your question. And without uh, further delay, I would like uh, to that, the, that Lucas uh, starts uh, the first uh, talk, uh, which is on learning to relax. Um, full title is Integrating Zero One Integer Linear Programming with uh, Pseudo Boolean Conflict Driven Search. Welcome to this video on integrating integer linear programming with conflict driven search. My name is Jo de Vriend and this is joint work with Ambros Gleixner, Jakob Nerdstrom and its continuing preliminary work by Jan Elfers. Let's work with an example. Suppose you have the following set of linear inequalities over Boolean variables. The task at hand is to decide whether these constraints have a solution or whether no such satisfying variable assignment exists. One approach to solve this problem is to execute a conflict-driven search algorithm. Conflict-driven search, at its core, is a depth-first search mechanism, but it derives implied constraints from conflicting search states and exploits them later. For this, conflict-driven search maintains some set of constraints, phi, and the partial variable assignment, alpha. Initially, Phi is the set of input constraints and alpha is the empty assignment. But during search, phi and alpha will grow and shrink. Let's solve our example using conflict-driven search. The first step is unit propagation. Unit propagation extends the partial assignment with those variable fixings that are implied by the constraints under the partial assignment. In our example, alpha is empty and no implied fixings exist yet. A conflict occurs if some constraint is falsified by the partial assignment. Currently, this is not the case, so we proceed to the next step. Here, we extend the partial assignment with some heuristic unassigned variable fixing, called a decision. If no unassigned variable exists, we have a full, non-conflicting assignment, so we found a solution and can stop the search. In our case, x is assigned to 0. I've simplified the constraints by replacing x with its assigned value. After this decision, we check again for unit propagation, but still none are implied by alpha. We check again for a conflict, but once more no constraint is falsified. So we extend alpha with a new decision, this time assigning y to 1. We again simplify the constraints and check for unit propagation. This time we're in luck. The second constraint can only be satisfied if z is 1 and v is 0. We extend the partial assignment and simplify the constraints. This leads to a conflict. The third constraint is falsified by alpha. Here is where the magic of conflict-driven search happens. From each conflict, it derives, it learns, an implied constraint that would have prevented this conflict from occurring in the first place. For this, it looks at the original constraints that were involved with the propagations that led to the conflict. In our example, this is constraint 2 and 3. If we manipulate these in the right way, in this case add constraint 2 twice and constraint 3 once, we get an appropriate learned constraint, which is still falsified by the partial assignment. We add this constraint to our set of constraints phi. We now backtrack, or rather back jump, to a state where the learned constraint is not falsified. Let's keep it simple and just back jump to the root. We continue with unit propagation. Indeed, 
our learned constraint can only be satisfied if y is zero, so we extend the partial assignment with this. After simplifying the constraints, the fourth constraint is propagating as well. x must be zero and w must be one. We keep extending the partial assignment and simplifying the constraints. Yet another constraint propagates, this time the first. We once more extend alpha and simplify the constraints. And now we reach a new conflict. The learned constraint is impossible to satisfy under the partial assignment. As we have a conflict, we will again learn a constraint. This time, we just add the three propagating constraints together to learn the trivial inconsistency. As this inconsistency is implied by the input problem, we can conclude that no solution existed. Hence, conflict-driven search ends and reports the problem was unsatisfiable. The key property of conflict-driven search is that it learns constraints from conflicts. These learned constraints push the search forward. So you want to generate many of them quickly, which in practice happens by having thousands of conflicts per second. Conflict-driven search was first developed for Boolean satisfiability solving, but it has been generalized to pseudo-Boolean solving, PB solving for short, which uses 0-1 integer linear inequalities as constraints. It is worth noting that learning a constraint from a conflict is a tricky technique with many degrees of freedom. However, this is also where the power of conflict-driven systems comes from. Okay, where does our work come into play? Let's have another look at the example. It is not only unsatisfiable over 0, 1, but it also does not allow rational solutions. If one were to run an LP solver, no search would even be needed. In theory, this is not an issue, as the conflict learning mechanisms are powerful enough to derive this rational infeasibility too. But in practice, PB solvers time out on certain rationally infeasible instances. So why not integrate an LP solver in the conflict-driven search loop? That is the focus of our work. An LP solver is a simple thing. It takes as input the LP relaxation of the input constraints, some variable bounds representing the partial assignment alpha, and an objective function. It outputs an optimal rational solution, or if no such solution exists, a set of multipliers that define a positive linear combination falsified by the partial assignment. As this linear combination exists by Farkas's lemma, we call these the Farkas multipliers, and the resulting constraint the Farkas constraint. In essence, our integration is pretty simple. If no conflict happened, before deciding a new variable, we run the LP solver and check whether the constraints under the partial assignment are rationally feasible. If they are, search continues as normal. If they are rationally infeasible, we extract the Farkas multipliers from the LP solver, and we use these to construct the Farkas constraint. The Farkas constraint is falsified under the partial assignment, so it triggers a conflict the same way any other constraint would, and we learn another constraint to nicely avoid this conflict in the future. Let's apply this technique to a slightly extended example. We introduce the variables a and b, and the fifth constraint, stating that a is at least as great as b. Suppose the solver now decides a to be zero, and hence propagates b to be 0 too. The reduced problem now simply is the rationally infeasible example we've been using throughout. Running an LP solver will detect this, and it could, for example, return these Farkas multipliers. Together, these define the Farkas constraint on the right, which is falsified by our partial assignment, and hence the conflict-driven search can continue by learning a new constraint. In theory, all of this works like a charm. But in practice, things get messy. A first issue is that LP solvers are slow compared to the regular conflict-driven search loop. To handle this, we limit the calls to the LP solver with a heuristic that balances the number of search conflicts to the number of LP solver pivots. A second issue is that fast LP solvers use inexact floating point arithmetic. And to remain sound, we cannot fully trust the reply of the LP solver. We work around this 
by recalculating the Farkas constraint with exact fixed precision arithmetic. However, as a result, it can happen that the Farkas constraint is not falsified by the partial assignment. In this case, we reset the LP solver and continue as if no rational infeasibility was detected. In the paper, we investigate a bunch more questions, such as how to improve the variable decision heuristic with LP solutions, how to incorporate cut generation into the conflict-driven search, and how to use learned constraints as cuts for the LP. But for the sake of brevity, let's skip forward to the experiments. This plot shows solver solve times on the y-axis for increasingly large dominating set problems on the x-axis. The black circles are the results of the open source MIP solver skip. As these dominating set instances are rationally infeasible, Skip has no problem with any of them. The three other solvers are pseudo-boolean solvers. The only one able to come close to Skip is NAPS, which uses a particularly efficient set encoding. The PB solvers, rounding SAT and SAT4J, however, definitely struggle on these objectively easy problems. What happens when we integrate Skip's LP solver, SOPLEX, into the conflict-driven search of rounding SAT? Of course, the problem now becomes easy. Soplex figures out there are no rational solutions, and the constructed Farkas constraint is a trivial inconsistency, which ends the search before it even begun. Next are some knapsack problems. What is shown now is a CDF plot. For a given timeout limit on the x-axis, how many instances on the y-axis would have been solved? In a nutshell, the higher the line, the better the solver performs. We keep comparing the three PB solvers and SKIP. SKIP employs a specialized dynamic programming routine to solve knapsack problems, so it performs almost optimal here. It is clear PB solvers are not great for solving knapsack instances, with rounding SOT solving only 520 instances and NAPS even solving little more than 100. However, integrating SOPLEX into rounding SOT more than halves the gap between SKIP and rounding SOT. We see the same pattern repeat when solving instances from the MIP-LIP collection. For these decision instances, we almost fully close the gap. And for these optimization instances, the gap is once again halved. Ok, time's up. If you're a pseudo-boolean or constraint programming developer, the main message of this work is that it is possible to efficiently and soundly integrate LP solving into the conflict-driven search routine. If you're from the integer programming side of things, thanks for all the work on developing strong LP solvers. But also, have a look at what conflict-driven pseudo-boolean solvers are doing these days. It should be possible to transfer the ID of learning 0-1 integer linear constraints to MIP systems. Definitely let me know if you're interested in doing this. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and uh, we have time for questions. So either uh, type them into the chat. Um, there have been no questions yet. Or you can also um, uh, switch on your video and you can ask the question uh, in person. And maybe while we wait for questions, um, maybe I can ask a question. Just in analogy to CDCL SAT solvers, there is uh, the close learning uh, um, concept. Um, there is always uh, the problem to learn too many clauses. So there are also some strategies for forgetting clauses, etc. Do you also run into this problem in, in your setting? Uh, and if, how do you deal with that? Um, first question, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right. Um, yeah, that definitely happens. Um, moreover, um, the problem when you have too many clauses in SOT solvers is that your unit propagation becomes slow. 
Um, and for PB solvers, uh, unit propagation is a more expensive operation than for clauses. So filling up with lots of uh, zero one integer linear constraints um, also has uh, a strong potential to slow down propagation and hence the solve loop and hence the number of conflicts you can derive. Um, so what you basically do is, is uh, a similar thing as what is done in SOT solvers. Um, every once in a while, we look at the constraint database. We um, sort the constraint according to some heuristic and we throw say half of them away. And the heuristic is, the, is, is actually uh, the same as in SOT, uh, at least for the rounding SOT solver. Um, you look at the LBD score and you look at the activity uh, as a tiebreaker, like the last time the constraint was, or how many times the constraint was used in recent conflict analysis, that's the tiebreaker, uh, if the LBD score is the same. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a question by Kai Hopman. Um, he asked, how do the coefficients of the constraint learned by the Farkash multipliers behave compared to the coefficients used in the original input constraints in practice? Um, interesting question. Um, we didn't do an analysis, so we have no, no numbers on this. Um, but any constraint we, we add to the solver um, basically fits uh, or has at most 32 bits for its coefficients. So while we use a large precision to construct the Farkas constraint, uh, we round it down in the end to 32 bits. Um, so I guess the, 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 even though the, the Farkas multipliers may need to be scaled up to keep precision, uh, in the end, the constraint we learn uh, has small coefficients. Mm -hmm. Um, Emir Demirovic asked, what is the strategy for regulating the cuts, del deleting learned constraints? I think it's somehow related to my question. Maybe you can give just a very quick uh, answer to that. Um, I'm going to ask for some clarification. Uh, cuts typically are, are something you add to an LP solver, mm -hmm. while learned constraints are something on the PB side. Um, so I already answered the PB side. Uh, maybe I'll just answer the uh, LP side. Um, the idea is that we use the same heuristics as uh, most MIP solvers. Uh, once a, a cut is no longer tight, um, uh, it gets removed. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, uh, yeah, how to say, uh, remove enough uh, rational solutions. If it doesn't tighten the convex hull sufficiently, it gets removed. Laurent Perron uh, asks, uh, what's the difference to what was presented yesterday on, on CPSAT? I'm not exactly sure what he's referring to. Um, do you I, I know I saw what the presentation? Means? Or I'm sorry for interrupting. No, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, I saw the presentation and um, yeah, I was, I was looking um, um, very fascinated to the presentation and lots of the things we do seem the same. Um, but I wasn't aware of your work, uh, and so there definitely uh, is some overlap there. Uh, three differences are, I guess, that we add all the constraints. Um, we don't uh, get propagation from the LP solver yet, though that is actually something we want to do. So that's an interesting idea I learned yesterday. Um, and I guess we have a different heuristic to limit the LP pivots. Um, those are the three differences I could immediately spot. Okay. okay uh, yo, could we add one more thing? I mean, the, the, the conflict analysis we use is exponentially stronger, right? Because we're exactly. operating directly on the linear constraints. So we're not yeah. extracting clausal reasons, but we're operating directly on the linear constraints. And that's exponentially more powerful than what is typically used in, in MIP and CP solvers in learning no goods. So this is a very important difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I think we should uh, move on to the next talk, but I want to um, emphasize that there is um, a, a Q&A session later, a combined Q&A session. So please uh, continue this interesting discussion then. But now um, um, I would like uh, that the next uh, video is started, which is a core guided and core boosted search for CP. Hello. In this video, 
I'm going to be talking about adapting core guided optimization techniques for constraint programming. So the first question is why this is something that we want to do. And now take a look at this simple optimization problem. And we have two sets of variables, a's and b's, and for each a, b pair, we have a constraint that at least one must be true. Right. Now we throw this into our favorite lazy clause generation constraint solver, and let's see how, how it goes. Okay, this is not great. It's basically growing exponentially uh, as n increases. And the reason for that is that the constraints on the AB pairs can't communicate well with the uh, actual objective term, right? They can't communicate bounds on subsets of variables, right? Now, this is a problem that uh, maxset solvers have, and basically it's resolved using unset core methods. So we're going to be building on the OLL algorithm for maxSAT. In OLL, basically we optimistically set all the terms in the objective to their optimum value, and then try and solve that. If we succeed, great, we've got the optimal solution. Otherwise, we get back an unsatisfiable core of uh, objective terms that can't collectively take their best value. Then what we do is we compute a new, essentially unary variable, which is the sum of penalties that we've taken. Uh, and so we replace the original variables with these aggregates so that they add up to the same value, and then we resolve. Now, if we want to adopt, adapt this to a constraint programming solver, uh, there are some things that make it nice and easy, because uh, in lazy clause generation solvers, uh, we often use atomic constraints of the form x is less than or equal to k, where k is a constant. Uh, and so this makes our life a bit easier. So if we look at basically a reduced version of this problem, then if we want to apply OLL, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to assume everything takes its minimum value. And then we're going to get back a core that says that, well, at least one of A1 and B1 must take a penalty. Uh, now, because we have linear constraints, we just introduce a new variable, P, which is the penalty for that core. And now we're going to adjust the objective so that the, the cost, the first value of P1 and P2 uh, gets factored into P, or of A1 and B1 gets factored into P1, uh, and then the rest is kept as usual. So use this clamp notation to say that, well, this is A1, but we've discounted the first cost of A1. Uh, now, when we're actually solving, we don't need these clamp variables that just def the explanation. Right. And then we resolve, we've relaxed the bounds on A1 and B1, uh, but we've constrained P1 to take at most one penalty. And we repeat, and we find that A2 and B2 must have a penalty. And so then we repeat the same process. And in the third iteration, we find it satisfiable with an overall penalty of two. Okay, now there are some slight complications, right? because we often have objectives where uh, the terms are weighted. And so if we have a core here, x and y are our core, but they have different coefficients. So we're going to have to sort of take the minimum value of those coefficients and just discount the value of x by that amount. So here we have our new penalty term, which is as before, x is greater than one or y is greater than or equal to one. Uh, but that is gonna have a coefficient of three which leaves a little bit left for the first value of uh, x. Right, now we'll come back to weight handling a little bit later. Uh, but really, that's the sort of the core of applying OLL to CP. But there are some issues that make this direct encoding a little bit less effective. Um, so the big difference between MaxSat and CP problems is that we have much larger domains in CP. So here we have a slightly different problem where x and y are both in the range of 0 and 2,000, uh, and there's a constraint that says that like one of them has to take a penalty of at least 1,000. So we're going to do the same thing. So we assume x is its minimum value and y is its minimum value, and we get a core that says that they have to take at least one penalty. So we add the penalty term, add our new assumptions, uh, and we find that they're going to have to have a penalty of at least two, and we're going to do that a thousand times. We're going to introduce a thousand variables. It's a bit of a pain. Okay. Now, 
modern LCG solvers do do lifting, right? So even if we assume uh, that x and y take the value zero, we might get a stronger core of uh, that says that, well, okay, uh, one is not enough, one of them has to take a penalty of a thousand. Uh, but with our reformulation, we can still only slice off individual penalty terms, right? Because they we have to add everything up together, uh, which means that even though we know that we can jump straight to a thousand, in the reformulation, we're going to have to introduce a thousand of these individual penalty slices. Uh, so that's not really ideal. Uh, so an alternate way of doing this, right? For, so getting further away from the max out view of things, I mean, we have integer variables. Why don't we just glue the variables that appear in a core together? So in this case, we get our core that says that x and y have uh, at least one of x and y has to take a penalty. And so we're going to introduce a new variable z, which is the sum of x and y. We know it has a lower bound of at least 1,000. Then we just replace both x and y in the objective with z. And then immediately, our new assumption is z is less than or equal to 1,000, and we find it satisfiable. Now, this is much more compact, right? The number of terms is bounded by the number of original variables uh, and is independent of the domains. But there are cases where this, like the shortest proof we can get is exponentially worse. Right? And so proving bounds on Z, we're basically now back in the branch and bound world. Um, so it's a trade-off. Okay, there's another problem in the lifting works when it works, but there's no guarantee it will. So what happens if we don't get that 1000 core immediately? So in this case, well, we're going to introduce the bound, uh, the variable Z with a lower bound of one. And then we're going to put that assumption in and we'll get a a new core of z is greater than equal to 2. We don't need a new variable, but we're just going to increase the lower bound by 1, add our new assumption, get a new core, and we're going to repeat that a thousand times. So that is less bad than before because we don't need to introduce new variables, but it's still not great because like every one of these iterations still has some overhead. Um, so what we can do is uh, instead of increasing by one each time, if we get a unit core, we just keep trying increasing values uh, in a geometric sequence, right? In the hopes that, well, if the lower bound of Z is actually much, much stronger than the one that we've currently got, uh, then hopefully the proof is gonna be short. So we'll just spend a bit of time trying to improve it. So in this case, we initially find our core that Z is at least two. So now we're going to increase our bound by two, right? So we're going to try z is less than or equal to four. If it succeeds, uh, all we can say is that our bound was at least two. But if we fail, if we prove on sat, then we can increase it straight to five, and then we'll jump again to, in this case, nine, right? We're going a sequence like plus one, plus two, plus four. Uh, so this allows us to push up the bound much, much faster. Um, and we keep going until we fail to prove on sat. Uh, so for this, we typically use like a, you know, a small fixed budget of conflicts, like 50 conflicts. Um, right, now the other consideration, I said I'd come back to coefficients earlier, right? So we do this discounting thing where, well, if we have x, y, and z uh, all appearing in a core, we're going to decrease those weights by the minimum of any of those, and the rest of them will hang around discounted for a while. Uh, so that's a little bit inconvenient uh, because, like, the later proofs might have cores like multiple cores involving x, uh, and that makes the proof a bit more annoying. Um, it like it's not, uh, and we can end up having further uh, more iterations, right? Uh, but again, we're in a CP solver, we have linear constraints. So what we can do is we can just uh, basically take the things in the core and just move the variables and their const uh, coefficients into there. Uh, so that's much easier. It's hopefully going to be better, uh, but not always. 
right? In some cases, we actually want to do that discounting so that we can reuse a penalty term with a large coefficient uh, in a bunch of cores. Here we have a single pe uh, large weight penalty that turns off a bunch of other cores. And so if we do this with weight elimination, we eliminate Z entirely in the first term, then every successive proof that we do gets harder and harder for the solver. Um, so really, we only want to do this uh, when it's going to be easier to solve. Uh, so a rough heuristic that we use is we only use elimination on terms that have similar coefficients, like similar order of, order of magnitude. Now, there are a bunch of other improves, max out improvements we can just hijack directly. So stratification is where we solve uh, high coefficient terms first and then gradually expand. Uh, and independent core extraction, where we sort of delay adding the penalty terms until we've run out of cores. Um, so both of these are really, really effective. And the other big one is core boosting, because core guided solvers are usually not very good at generating any time solutions. They're mostly all or nothing. Um, so with core boosting, we just run core guided optimization for a while, a proportion of our search time, uh, and then we just switch back to branch and bound using the reformulations we've done already. So this is pretty good. It means that we get the sort of early gains from core guided plus most of the anytime behavior of branch and bound. Um, so doing this is really easy for variable-based reformulation, right? The variables are already there. Uh, it's trickier, and you can read about that in the paper for slice-based, um, but it's doable with some uh, fiddling. Right, so how does this work in practice? So here you can see some lovely plots. Uh, the basic takeaways are that core-guided and branch and bound actually perform pretty competitively, but on very, very different sets of instances, right? We can see here that like there's lots of things where one times out, but not the other. Um, and generally speaking, uh, core boosting is just really good. You should be using it. Um, or at the very least, using branch and bound and core guided in a portfolio strategy. Um, in terms of the improvements that we made, uh, variable-based reformulation tends to be better. Uh, for weight elimination, uh, it's a bit of a trade-off. Right? It doesn't really help, but it doesn't hurt that much uh, for proving optimality. But it does tend to end up with better uh, suboptimal solutions. Right? So if you're like running anytime, maybe weight elimination is a good strategy. Um, all right. Okay. Um... <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, any questions? You can also just uh, switch on your video or audio and ask the question while we wait for any questions arriving in the uh, chat box. Um, while we wait on this, actually, uh, maybe I ask a question. Um, I was actually quite interested in, in looking at this uh, cactus plot kind of uh, figure at the very end because I think for you for this work is very interesting how this anytime behavior works how quickly you approach the optimum can you um, elaborate a little bit more on that how um, this this trajectory um, behaves also compared to other anytime methods um, hmm okay uh, so uh, what we tend to find is that there are some problems that branch and bound solves really, really easily, right? Uh, and there are some things where uh, there's lots of independent terms that like take penalties, like that first example that we showed. Um, and so for those, if you're running branch and bound to begin with, you you'll you might find a good solution early, but you'll basically never prove it. Um, and so if you run core guided initially, then you'll be able to capture those really fast. Um, so I think in some initial versions, we found that pretty much all the cases where uh, core guided solved the problem, it was solved in like 60 seconds, and then basically it stalled. Um, so in terms of other branch and bound methods, well, sorry, uh, other anytime methods, um, I'm not sure that we've, like what other kinds of methods did you have in mind? 
Yeah, no, I, I guess the branch account is, uh, I guess, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. standard one to compare to. Yeah, yeah, like in terms of uh, suboptimal solutions, uh, if you can't get the uh, core guided proof, then branch inbound will generally give you better uh, than sorry, better suboptimal solutions than pure core guided. Mm -hmm. um, but we did find cases where core boosting gave better in, uh, better suboptimal solutions than either of the pure methods. Um, what kind of benchmark instances did you use for uh, doing the experimental comparisons? Uh, we so we grabbed all the past. So I think the minizing challenge instances from 2015 to 2018, um, and grabbed anything with a linear objective. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. This sounds like quite an extensive uh, experimental evaluation. Um, if there are no further questions, I don't see any in the chat box. Um, so um, I would uh, then like to move on to the next talk, but um, again, point to the coffee break. Are there one more? Yes, uh, the coffee break at 4.30 Vienna time, where um, I guess you will be available for further discussions and questions. Thank you. And we move to the um, third uh, regular talk, um, which uh, is uh, entitled From MiniSync to Optimization Modular Theories and Back. Welcome, everyone. My name is Francesco Contaldo, and I'm here to present uh, From MiniSync to Optimization Modular Theories and Back. This work has been done along with the Dr. Patrick Trentin and the Professor Roberto Sebastiani from the University of Trento. We start with MiniZinc, which is a widely adopted uh, language to uh, define a finite domain constraint problem, uh, which are problems composed by a set of variables and constraint. Optionally, there can be an objective. And the goal for a constraint solver is to find an assignment for all the variables which satisfy all the constraints. Uh, the input for constraint solver is FlatZinc, which is uh, a translation of the MiniZinc problem using the MiniZinc to FlatZinc tool. Uh, some features uh, related to the constraint solvers uh, are that they are very efficient into linear arithmetic and they are capable to handle high level constraints. Uh, but they map real variables into finite precision arithmetic and Boolean are represented using 0, 1 integer. Uh, some applications in the real world are related to planning and scheduling problems. Then we have OMT. OMT is uh, an extension of satisfiability modulo theories. And when we solve an OMT problem, uh, we are finding a model which satisfies an input uh, formula, a first order logic formula, with the respect of uh, one or more theories. Uh, and at the same time, that model has to minimize one or more objective. MT solvers are very efficient uh, into the Boolean reasoning, and they use an incremental search approach. Uh, there are several applications of OMT problems in the real world. Uh, some are related to formal verification, model checking, and planning and scheduling as well. The input for uh, OMT solver is SMTLib. It's a very expressive language, but as an, at the same time, it results of a very verbose, uh, a very low-level language. So, as far as we have seen, um, two communities apparently very distant from each other, but there exists an overlap uh, among the problems they solve. And we wanted to uh, bridge the MiniZinc and the OMT communities by removing these language barriers that limit the interoperability and the cooperation uh, between these two communities. So the main contribution of this work is, is the realizations of two uh, compilers. The first one is a FlatZinc to MT compiler, and the other one is an MT to MiniZinc compiler. 
And thanks to these two tools, we are able to in, compare empirically problems coming from both community. The first uh, tool is Flatzing 20 Translator is embedded into Optimapsat and uh, can solve Flatzing model directly and it is able to produce uh, an SMTLIP translation of the Flatzing input problem and so any other SMT and MT solvers can uh, can deal with it, can try to solve it. The translations details are reported here. Um, most all the flattening data type uh, have its own correspondent uh, OMT terms. Um, I want to highlight that the float are mapped into linear rational arithmetic terms, so optimums that can exploit uh, infinite precision arithmetic. Uh, Pseudo-Boolean constraints that uh, are um, represented as 0, 1 uh, arithmetic constraints are then uh, on the fly uh, reversed engineered uh, exploiting sorting networks. Then, uh, thanks to this interface, we can also accept uh, multi-objective flattening uh, uh, problem and optimize that uh, can solve uh, multi-objective problems in three different uh, flavors using uh, Pareto optimization or lexicographic or multi-independent optimization. Then we have our MT2 MiniZinc. Uh, it is a Python tool that has been built on top of PySMT and um, it's able to translate single and multi-objective linear integer arithmetic and bit vector uh, OMT problem. Um, inside this tool change we built to translate and, and uh, test empirically problems and software coming from both community. We had to introduce extended MiniZinc to FlatZinc. This because MiniZinc to FlatZinc tend to perform some uh, deduction step and uh, it was uh, replacing some critical fractions in the minizing problem with its uh, finite uh, precision arithmetic representation and this was introducing some error because uh, especially for optimats because optimats can use infinite precision arithmetic so in order to overcome this uh, limitation of minizing to flat zinc, we introduced some placeholder uh, to preserve these uh, fractions during the translation step. Its minizing data type has been uh, uh, mapped against its correspondent uh, OMT terms. We did not specify any domains for the integer uh, variable, this because there is no notion of uh, domains into OMT, into the OMT word and SMT lib. Um, but we were first to, to, to introduce domains for the float variable because all the, all the solver were not accepting uh, float variable without domain. Sub constraints are converted using pseudo Boolean sum and bit vector are represented using integers and uh, modular arithmetic. Multi-objective uh, OMT problem are translated uh, with several with separated minizing file. Uh, if the input problem is a multi-independent OMT problem, and instead we use mini-search to deal with lexicographic optimization problem, uh, producing as up to as output one single minizing file. Here we are presenting some uh, experimental result. The first result was uh, involving benchmarks coming from the MiniZing challenge, and we used the 10 top scoring MiniZing solvers and free uh, OMT solver. And as we can see, the, the best results uh, have been obtained by MiniZing solvers, especially for our tools. Uh, the top five MiniZing uh, Two of the top five minutes in solvers were using a SAT approach, and the best uh, OMT solver was uh, that, uh, Z3 uh, and Optimasat halfway 
placement, as obtained at an halfway placement. Uh, instead, here we are comparing OMT benchmarks. Uh, we use either uh, linear integer arithmetic problem and uh, linear, rash linear rational arithmetic problems. Um, for what it concerns, uh, linear integer arithmetic problem, uh, the best result have been obtained by Optimatsat uh, using the FloodZink interface. Uh, we are we, we are justifying this result due to the deduction capabilities of the MiniZink compiler, which can simplify some uh, dummy constraints in the in the input formula. And most of the of the MiniZink solvers were reporting uh, errors during the solving phase. And some of them, most of them, also uh, time out on the on the input formula. Here we are uh, presenting the result for the linear rational arithmetic benchmark. Um, all the FloodZink solver, even Optimatsat, were reporting a lot of uh, incorrect result. Um, this is because uh, the lack of infinite precision arithmetic and also uh, due to the noise introduced by MiniZink to FloodZink. And to justify this, we have performed the same experiment using Optimatsat uh, with the extended version of MiniZink to FloodZink, so preserving the input fractions. And uh, as we can see, we uh, have produced no error and for all the input problems which were correctly solved. So, conclusions. Uh, we bridged MiniZink and OMT communities together uh, with the introduction of two new tools. Uh, we compared empirically the two approaches. The future works is to extend OptiMatsat with T-Solver for finite sets and extend the OMT to MiniZinc to support more theories and also extract FlatZinc to OMT uh, from OptiMatsat and make it open source. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question by Emir. Um, whether did you notice any SMT theories that were useful for solving, but that CP did not support? Uh, maybe I, I try to answer, um, Roberto. Uh, okay, first of all, when we are speaking of theories, we mean theories uh, when they have a notion of a greater equal. Okay, so we, they must have some notion of arithmetic inside it. Well, to this extent, you could, in principle, have, for instance, theory of strings uh, or I think that arrays, uh, the notion of a theory of arrays in, you know, in SMT is something different uh, uh, with respect to that uh, of the ending of array in, in constraint programmers. So in general, of course, we focused on theories uh, or theories which uh, had uh, an arithmetic flavor. So they had the notion of smaller equal to system. But of course, you can uh, and something we have for free in, in our MT is that once we, uh, once the objective is given in a given theory, typically something arithmetic like uh, arithmetic, uh, linear, uh, linear arithmetic, or bit vectors, or whatever, you the rest of the uh, formula, so the rest of the constraint can, can be an arbitrary combination of, of theories. Of course, the interesting part, and that's where the next work will be on a nonlinear arithmetic, which is something that we are targeting. But of course, we are still far from uh, uh, having a. We have some first uh, little prototypes, but there is nothing yet, mm -hmm. anything ready at all. Okay. Um, uh, Peter asks whether you investigated more deeply. Those four instances where MiniSync improved the OMT solver, and um, whether it uh, possibly was 
due to linearization. Yeah, we have tried to investigate those instances, but we have not found uh, an obvious reason why the um, solver was behaving much better after uh, the translation. Uh, so our educated guess was that was uh, happening, something happening to translation from minisync to flat uh, sync. Uh, so some. Um, you yeah, did, you didn't use two phase compilation. Yeah, so you didn't use two. You wouldn't have used it unless you'd set it up specifically. But if you use two phase compilation, you'd run G code as a pre solver essentially. But if you didn't set it up, it wouldn't be doing it by default. Yeah, no, we have used the default configuration, so it's, it's possible it was not being uh, activated. Yeah, I'm just trying to track down what it might be. It's very interesting. Thank you. Okay, another question by Emir. Whether benchmarks for OMT was clearly better? Uh, well, uh, of course. Uh, you, well, I mean, you mean benchmark, uh, which kind of benchmark are you speaking about? Benchmark coming from Inzinka or, or benchmark coming from OMT? Because for the, okay, from OMT, uh, if you look at the uh, the, the results were most of them, uh, both on the integer. I mean, we emphasize maybe we, the, we went too fast on, on the fact that we made too much emphasis on the four, on the four uh, different. But with respect to missing tools, uh, we are uniformly better on OMT on problems coming from OMT. Okay, so the, the question is. I think on coming from uh, uh, the problems coming from uh, Minzink uh, challenge. Uh, maybe I let the uh, answer Patrick or Francesco on that. Mm -hmm. On the on problem coming from from Minzink, uh, uh, the OMT solvers uh, were not uh, the best performer with respect to the to the other FlatSync solvers uh, from from the test we did. Uh, but they they they, act, they they perform well because they, they are placed in respect to the other mini zinc solvers. So uh, the result was uh, very good, even if they were not the best. Um, okay, um, yeah, I think it's still an interesting uh, discussion, which uh, we can uh, continue at four thirty at the coffee break. Um, and now let's uh, move on to the two short talks. Um, the first is on justifying all the differences using pseudo Boolean reasoning. And the second one is using CP and MIP techniques to tackle the multi-mode resource problem. Um, um, please start both videos now. Hello, my name is Stefan Gort. And I want to talk to you about our approach for justifying all different reasoning as using constraint programming algorithms by using pseudo Boolean reasoning. So usually you have a problem and then you have your favorite solver and then it answers say 32. And then of course 42 is always the correct answer. But in general, we don't really know if the answer is correct because it could be that there is a bug and it returns the wrong answer. So to avoid this, you could try to do extensive testing, but you're not going to find every bug that is in your program. Or you could try to verify your algorithm. However, this also takes a lot of time and is very expensive. So what we want to do instead is that we do not only provide an answer, to the problem, but we also let the solver produce a certificate. So then we can take the problem, the answer and the certificate, and together we can verify it and figure out, no, 41 is not a correct answer. Or on the other hand, if we have, say, no bug and we get the right answer 42, then the verifier can actually say, yes, this is a correct answer. And the idea is that certifying an answer is much easier than a formal verification of your full solver. But on the other hand, the verifier is also much simpler than a solver 
So the verifier might actually be formally verifiable. We didn't do this yet, but this is definitely one of the uh, things that is on our list. All right, then let's directly look at how this is looking in practice. So here we would have a problem in the OPB format, which is just pseudo boolean constraints. So we have linear inequalities and the variables are either zero or one. So for example, here, the variable x15 is actually an encoding for the fact that x1 is five. So x15 is one, if and only if x1 is five. So if x1 is not five, it's zero. And then we can have like constraints like this one here is an at least one constraint or here we would have an at most one constraint. But then how does a proof look like? How could a proof for such a formula look like? The proof is done here and the first thing we do is that we load the formula. And then what we can do is that we can start computing with the constraints. So we are just adding say constraint three and constraint four together and this is written down here in Polish notation, though the plus sign is always afterwards. So after adding three and four, we're also going to add five, 14 and 15 and so on. So eventually we can this way derive a contradiction. So here constraint 17 is declared to be a contradiction and by contradiction, what we mean is that zero is greater than equal to one. And the idea here is that all of these steps are very simple to verify and the solver can actually write down this stuff. So if you have a constraint programming solver that does all different propagation, then it's actually always possible to produce a proof like the one shown here. And so you can afterwards certify that the answer of your solver is correct. Note that our proof doesn't know anything about all different and how the algorithm works. It's really just a very simple way of writing down what the solver does so that it's then afterwards easy to verify. All right, so what is our contribution? So we propose a new general purpose proof format. It's pseudo Boolean proofs. And we also have a verifier for it, a very PB, that you are free to like have a look at, download, test, see if you like it. And then we already have like multiple results showing that this is actually practical to be used. So for example, the paper that I uh, was talking about now, it was saying that we can do all different reasoning in constraint programming. And of course, because how the format is designed, we can always do reasoning with zero one linear inequalities. But we also showed that it's a much richer format that can also be used to say, um, produce certificates for subgraph isomorphism solvers or for clique and maximum com connected subgraph solvers. So even when we have graph properties, you could think like, well, maybe we need a different proof format for that, right? Because it's talking about graphs and not about some inequalities. But it turns out that we can actually use the same format for this also. And then for future work, we want to capture more types of reasoning. So for example, in constraint programming solvers, there are a lot of other propagators that we could produce proof logging for. And it would also be nice to have very PB as an accepted standard. And then we can also try to provide efficient proof looking for other paradigms like MAXAT or pseudo boolean optimization or MIP solving. Let's see what the future brings. Welcome everybody, my name is Patrick Gerz, I'm working at Helmut Schmidt University in Hamburg and today I'm going to talk about the multimode resource investment problem and how we uh, try to solve it using constraint programming and mixed integer programming techniques. First a quick introduction into the problem setting. Uh, the multimode resource investment problem is a project scheduling problem. We have activities that um, need resources for the uh, processing. And for each activity, we have multiple modes in which we can process them. So we can have a fast mode that uses uh, a lot of resources, or we can have a slow mode that uses only less resources for the activity. We have two, we distinguish two types of uh, resources. The renewable resources, which are something like a crane or workers, they are replenished after each uh, time period. And we have the non-renewable resources that model something like uh, raw materials or the budget of the project. And 
for all of the resources that are involved in a project, we can decide how many of uh, them are added to the um, project, but they all come with a cost, and our objective is to minimize the resource costs. We also have some side constraints, like uh, precedence constraints among the activities and the project deadline that needs to be respected. At. So, small example here with five activities. We have uh, here the precedence constraints are displayed with the arcs. So, uh, one and two have precedence among each other. One and three can be processed in parallel, and the due date is, uh, or the deadline is four. Um, here we use three units of resources, so we always look at the peak uh, resource consumption. But if we change the mode of activity three to a slower one, um, we can also maintain the deadline and uh, only use two resource units. So to tackle this problem we used two techniques. One was a constraint programming. We used IBM iLog CP optimizer uh, software to so uh, solve the constraint pro programming formulation and it comes with a feature that is called interval variables. This is uh, very useful to model um, the start and finish times of activities and uh, we have multiple interval variables for each activity so we can also model the uh, mode decision and we link them with alternative constraints. And for the resource consumption, we use the cumulative pulse operator to sum up the resource uh, needs of each activity when they are active. And for the mixed integer programming, we used t three types of binary variables, pulse variables, step variables, and on-off variables. And um, those models were adapted from the RCPSP, which is a close relative uh, of this problem, but there we have a different uh, objective function and no deadline. And uh, the precedence constraints, um, we modeled them in an aggregated and a disaggregated form, so for the disaggregated models um, we have this extra D in the formulation, and we solved this um, mixed integer programming formulations using Kurobi software. So, as a benchmark data set, we use the RIPLIP, which is available at uh, this website here. And it, it features multiple um, instances with 30, 50, and 100 activities, and uh, 2, 4, and 8 resources, for example, and multiple modes for each, in, uh, for each activity. And if we take a look at how the uh, different uh, procedures compared against each other regarding the feasibility. We see that constraint program had no problems uh, finding feasible solutions, but some of the mixed integer programming uh, formulations did have a lot of problems, especially when the uh, maximum runtime was only 60 seconds. Um, interestingly, when we look at the number of optimal solutions, in 60 seconds constraint program found more optimal solutions than uh, the MIP uh, formulations in one hour. So we can see that constraint programming solved more instances. And yeah, if we take a look at some of the instance features, mostly the instances with a uh, small number of activities, so 30 activities were solved to optimality. And for the number of resources for the constraint programming approach, it didn't matter so much. But for the MIP formulations, uh, it, sh it showed a difference in performance. So we see that constraint programming is faster and produces more optimal solutions and we try to incorporate this uh, CP approach in some hybrid meta heuristics like large neighborhood search in the future uh, to tackle also larger instances and also test it on a related problem in uh, formulations like uh, RCPSP or the multimode RCPSP. Thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to answer some questions. Yeah, thank you uh, for these short talks. Uh, we don't have dedicated question time right after the talk, but you are welcome to ask questions uh, then at 4.30 or maybe a bit after 4.30 when the coffee break starts. Um, and so I'm, we are coming here to the end of this session. I would like uh, to thank all uh, who presented uh, their papers and also who asked questions. And for your attendance and I hand over to, to Louis Martin Rousseau for who chairs the next session which is also on hybrid methods. Um, thank you very much.